Welcome to Rebel Without Applause, where we explore the intersection of sports, entertainment, and culture. I'm your host, Maurice Bob, and today we have a very special guest on the line. He is a writer, a novelist, a former attorney, and now a movie script writer. Please welcome to the program, Marcus J. Guillory. How you doing, sir? I'm well. Thanks for having me, man. Uh, same here. Good to see you. It's been a while. Um, how are you holding up out there in L.A.? Uh, you know, I'm good. You know, the writers, we're all, we're used to being at home so and being sequestered. So this is kind of another day in the office. And right now in Hollywood, you know, we're really like the only ones working. So there's like virtual writers rooms going on all over the place. And you know, you're doing notes, calls, and everything. So it's just, I've been in here all day. <laughs> Writing. This is old hat for you. Yeah, yeah. Par for the course. Ooh. All right, well, uh, you know, i like to start off with a, uh, you know, first question being, you know, uh, being that this is a, you know, a show that focuses on rebelling. You know, what's your most rebellious moment, you know, when you look back on your life? Outside of dumb teenage stuff. <laughs> <laughs> We've all had those. Yeah, we all had those. I think uh, I think it's important even to answer that. Is to, in order, it's probably important to define it. I mean, usually when you, you take action that's considered rebellious, part of that is there is a presumption that you're going to behave or take certain action to begin with, and then you don't do that. Right. And so they say you're rebelling, you know, you're going against something. Um, there have been a few instances where I kind of struck away from the norm, but probably uh, the most dynamic and it was very public was was uh, leaving the practice of law uh, and turning into a writer producer. Uh, I was an entertainment lawyer in Hollywood. Um, for about four years, four or five years. And um, I just said, man, you know, I need to do something else. And I think a part of that, what was crazy about it was I had the job that everybody wanted. I was a straight up film, TV, and music lawyer, right? And it's a very hard job to get. When I left, I graduated from uh, Tulane Law School in New Orleans, and um, I came out to L.A. I got a three-month externship at the Directors Guild in the legal department. And so it was a program for law students who had just graduated. So that would give you time to you know, prepare for the bar and take interviews with law firms and uh, in-house counsel jobs, legal departments at studios and networks, and record companies. And um, I got this job at a black entertainment law firm in San Monica that was really well known. Uh, so I got the great job, right? And I did every conceivable thing I thought an entertainment lawyer would do. The sexy stuff from cutting deals on yachts and flying around the world and jets with a briefcase full of money to go buy, music catalogs, all kind of just extra stuff, right? Um, however, when I was in law school, I was also a musician. I've always been a musician through everything, right? And when I was in law school, initially, I didn't have any idea what area I was going to practice in. Um, some people had said, you know, if you go in be a tax lawyer, you'll make good money or whatever. And so I was performing uh, a lot and recording with an artist named Bill Summers, a really famous percussionist uh, from the Headhunters with Herbie Hancock and uh, Grammy Award winning Los Angeles Caliente. Like he's the dude, right? And his, okay. his studio and crib was right up the street from the law school. So I was there a lot. And, uh, you know, I, I'd be in there doing session work, you know, you make your little money real quick and you're in there with other musicians and, you know, some of the guys would be like, say, bro, you're in that law school? And I'm like, 
yeah, man. So can you take a look at this contract for me, bro? And uh, that's how it started. You know, I ended up doing my, my first record deal when I was a second year law student. I had to hire a lawyer to make it look clean. But at that point, I knew what I was going to do, right? So I get, the, I, that's the setup. I get the job, you know, and I'm one of maybe, at the time, maybe two people I knew that went directly from law school into entertainment law. It's almost impossible. Typically, you do a couple years corporate law and then you transition in. Well, anyways, I get the job. I do the job. I have a ball with the job. Writing a book about those days, in fact, and uh, maybe even a TV show. We're working on that now. But the bigger my clients got, the deeper I got into it, the more money I made, the more a couple of things, the clients started to feel like the people I was, try I was trying to protect them from. And I wasn't necessarily keen on the person I was becoming. And I was aware of it. And I say, ah, got to do something else. I told the manager partner and he said, yeah, you know, you're young, you know, you don't have any kids, you're not married, you know, if you're going to do it, do it now. You can always go back and hang a shingle up. Um, so I did it. And I was first generation college and all of that. And I realized that no one would understand this. And if you think about, you know, your parents sending you money, you know, the care packages, all the rosaries that were said so you could pass tests. Um, Even the bragging rights saying, oh, my son or so-and-so yeah. is a lawyer. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of weight in those bragging rights. A lot of it. And I realized that I was going to disappoint, deeply disappoint people who I really, really loved. And that really bothered me. But I took that energy and that became the catalyst to push really, really hard at what I was doing. And it was hard and it took a long time to get right. You know, I had to pretty much give up everything, literally, materially. All of the accoutrement of success that I had acquired and collected during the course of, you know, having an attorney's salary and, and all of the extra swag and shit you get when you work in Hollywood, I had to give it all up. And, uh, you know. Well, everything is up to Porsche, right? <laughs> well, that was before the Porsche. <laughs> you know, I had to give up the Mercedes and the drop top uh, Mustang and the motorcycles and all the electric guitars. I gave up all, all of that stuff from when I was a lawyer. And uh, to the point where I was living in a truck in this park for a little bit, writing and uh I was by a wiener schnitzel, and I remember in the, mor the morning manager would let me come in and take a bird bath in the uh, employee's bathroom and let me type up what I had written. He knew I wasn't on drugs. He knew I wasn't, you know, didn't have mental health issues or anything like that. I just got caught in a situation. I didn't have no, I, I had spent like a, a month on this one girl's couch, and then her landlord kicked me out. Uh, I slept in the back of a tattoo parlor for about two months, but there's a lot of real crazy nefarious stuff going on over there. Uh, I stayed on the cousin's floor for like a week. And ultimately I just ended up living in my truck for about six months and uh, still writing every day, you know, and, and getting my sea legs in it. And then uh, after a while I started booking stuff, people started reading me and, started hiring me to write, you know, and the whole time I couldn't call home and let them know what was going on. You know, that would have broke their heart, man. And that's the, the worst thing you can do to a parent. If you're a child is give them a problem that they can't fix. And neither one of my parents at the time were in a financial position to really like support me at the same time. You know, I left this lucrative legal career. So I was kind of in a bind. I couldn't say anything, you know, and I and I, and I kind of disappeared from Hollywood. You know, you can't you got to be aware that you got to keep appearances. So I just disappeared and sunk into writing uh, real heavy, you know, and ultimately, you know, shit started happening. Man, it took a while. Though. And I was probably rebellious in a sense that I completely left something 
on a whim, actually. Like, oh, uh, you know, at the same time, I think I was doing it to preserve my soul. And some most people won't do that. They'll just get that money, you know, it'll tear them up inside or whatever. But I wanted to land, I wanted to land on the on my feet as a person a certain kind of way, you know. And I knew that it was going to work out. I thought I did. At least that's what I was telling myself. I had one prayer in those days. It was real simple. And people ask me, you know, I don't, I don't pray for myself. I pray for other people, but I really, I don't pray for myself. And when I tell my mother that, she feels some kind of way. And I was like, no, no, it's just I got, I can handle what I need to handle. Other people will need that. But my prayer was this: I don't want to die, and I don't want to go to jail. Amen. And for six months, I I slept in the back of that truck um, with a duffel bag full of clothes I used as a pillow and a, a 44 underneath that because you're out in the world. Anything can happen. I saw a lot of crazy shit out there. And so, you know, I, I slept on top of a, a pistol for six months, man. Wow. Yeah. That was that. I think it's the first time I'm publicly talking about that because I don't really talk about those days too much. But that was a long time ago. But that was. Well, it sounds like, you know, you hit a point where, you know, like you said, you were flowing along. You know, you were the first one to kind of go straight from law school to a very high profile position that uh, most people would envy and want. Right. It sounds like you had like some kind of tipping point moment. You know, some, somewhat like Dave Chappelle did where, you know, he realized that he was in it for the wrong reasons or something and he just dropped it all. It sounds like you had that same similar kind of moment. Uh, well, Dave, Dave's thing was different in that what he was being asked to do, he didn't agree with. And so his thing was more about the principles of who you are with respect to your work. For me, it was more of trying to preserve my character in a certain kind of way. I didn't like who I was becoming. Now, keep in mind, I'm responsible for who I'm becoming. So there's a bit of an oxymoron there. Because it's like, well, dude, you control that. I just like, nah, I got to stop this. You know, I got to stop what I'm doing and do something else. You know, and so I, I left and, and everybody tripped. They wouldn't tell me that. Like, I didn't find out that. I found out years later, once everything was cool and popping, at dinner with my mom, that she had told me that in those days she thought I was on drugs. <laughs> wow. Was that, was that a, a better thing to kind of lean on instead of, oh, you, you failed? You know no, what you're doing? It wasn't, it wasn't a failure. It's like I just left. I, you know, I could have kept doing that, you know? And so... I just said, no, nah, I got to do something else. My boss got it. He understood, you know, and so it's like I haven't had much failure. You know, I've been fortunate enough to, to have a really solid track record of achieving a lot of things, I'd say, since high school, you know, and people knew me in high school. You know, I was that dude, you know, and so when you I think what goes behind it is the work ethic. My work ethic is crazy for everything. So if you got certain kind of habits and behaviors that are productive, you will get results. You know what I'm saying? And I've been like that for a long time. Um, and I think that, and I know my machine, I know who I am. And enough to clock it and say, oh, we turned it into something else, man. This isn't cool. We got to change it up. Very self-aware. But here's the other thing. When I left, this is important. I didn't know I was going to be a writer. I didn't leave law to be a writer. And that's important. You just I, left to save yourself. Exactly. I had to go figure out what I was going to do. My boss told me, well, for a transition job, it's probably a good idea if you go and work for a client of yours that needs you and can afford you. And so I ran development for Rough Rider Film Company. Uh, they were a client. And that's how I started writing and producing. So what what is something that you worked on that we that we would know? With those guys, nothing. I mean, we had a lot of stuff in development. We had some director video stuff. 
uh, but nothing really materialized in a way that would be significant, you know, which is one of the reasons I left. They're great guys. I love YD. They're super cool. But it just wasn't, by the time I left them, I was starting to get hired to write, you know, screenplays. And that started this whole trajectory of me being an independent producer, writer, you know, and, you know, yeah. And I think, you know, and then people started reading my words, like, yo, this, you got to check this guy out. And it's word of mouth, man. Your words, the cool thing about your words is that you don't have to be there to present yourself. I just got off the phone with my agent a couple of hours ago. Some Somebody read something I wrote and wanted me to do something. And that's all the time. You never know who's reading you when you're a writer. And if you're good and people talking about it, then they'll come to you. I get that question from young writers all the time. Like, how do you get an agent and all of this stuff? And it's a real simple answer. It's like, one, you don't get an agent. They get you. And two, if people aren't talking about what you're doing, then you're not doing it. You know? Yep, it up. That's just all. That's just, I don't care if you make chairs or if you write books or whatever you do. If people are not talking about what you're doing, you're not really doing it. You I mean, you, you're doing it, but you're not standing out. You got to go back to the woodshed. And so I had some pieces, particularly this, this film called Gully. And we'll get to that in a minute because that changed my entire career. And what happened was, you know, by the time that happened, everything was different after that, you know. So so tell me, okay, so take me to, from, you know, like you said, sleeping in your truck, yeah, 45 under your pillow. How did you get from that particular point in your life to at least the first genesis of uh, being a writer on a regular and, you know, getting out of the truck into, you know, uh, your own place. Well, here's the thing. First is like getting situated. So like a good friend of mine's girlfriend clocked what was going on by accident. She saw me. She told him because I kept my phone on. I wasn't telling anybody what I was doing. It was just like, yo, I was taking calls, trying to get meetings, you know, all of that. And um, he invited, he, he and his girlfriend lived in Venice. She was going to go to Paris, you know. And so he said, hey, man, you can come stay here with us for a little bit if you want to. I'm like, okay. So I went over there, stayed in Venice for like three weeks. And then he said, yo, my uncle's house sitting in this big old crib in the West Adams district over there by USC. And, uh, you know. Let's go over there and see him. It's huge, huge Victorian house. Old man living there by himself. He was fun. I didn't have any money. And he said, yeah, you can stay here. He has a whole back house in the back. You can stay in there. You can stay in here. And if you get some money, you put some money on. There's always grocery here. And he was kind, man. And he was welcoming. And he had no obligation or reason to do that. He knew I was a writer. I wasn't. You know, dealing with, like I said, I wasn't dealing with any drug issues. I didn't have anything that was pulling me away. I just, I'm writing. You know, I'm mean, those days I'm writing like seven, 16 to 18 hours a day, you know, and I'm putting out a lot of material and I'm trying to find my voice without knowing this. I'm finding my voice as a writer. And you got to be in it. You got to surrender to it to get there. If you don't surrender to it, you're not going to get there. I'm, you know, there's a lot of people like they want to have best of both worlds. They want I'm going to write on Saturday mornings for blah, blah, blah. And then they wonder why, you know, they just not put in enough time. That rule of 10,000 hours is true. You know, it's very true. And so I stayed there for two years. And while I was there, um, I started writing short stories. <clears throat> and the short stories started getting published. A lot of them. And I was like, oh, shit. Okay. People are checking things out. I had a script called Gully that I wrote that was starting to make the rounds. And I was low-key starting to get, like, rewrite work. Like, yo, that's the guy who wrote Gully, you know, blue, blue, blue. And Gully was just wild, you know. And it was kind of like everybody knew me for that. Oh, that's that guy that writes that weird shit. Okay. <laughs> Let's, you know, all right. All the rappers knew about it, you know, all this stuff. But it started slowly getting me work. And then I started working on a novel. Um, eventually, this is crazy, the house that me and this old man living in, the woman who owns it, who's like some child actor that 
was building an artist commune in the desert for real. Um, she kicked us out, both of us. So I'm like, shit, here we go again, man. It just so happens that all of my stuff was in a friend of mine's garage and she was cool with me leaving it there. And I needed to go to Houston and Louisiana to do research for this novel. So I told my dad, hey, I'm coming down there. I got to do some work on a book. I'm going to be down there for a few months. He didn't really know. I didn't have any other prospects. He didn't really ask. Um, I get to Houston and I don't have any money. And uh, my cousin, uh, David uh, Anderson, uh, who's an entrepreneur in Houston. I know Dave. Yeah. He said, man, there's this guy you should meet that uh, he's a video director, but he's really in the movies. I think you guys would get along. I was like, oh, okay, cool. You know, I used to, you know, I had wrote videos. I was just starting to write a few videos for people back in those days. Uh, I'd wrote a video for Common called Testify, which was originally um, a short film that Geffen paid me to write and then Anthony Mandel directed it and chopped it down to about 13 pages. And it's a lot okay. of pages in it. Wood Harris always do. Anyways, he introduces me to a guy named John Tucker, who goes by the name of Dr. Teeth. And I go and meet John, and we get to talking about film. Now, what I had known about the guy was, you know, he's the big Southern rap video director. He does all, like, every big... Southern rapper, he's probably directed their first video. Um, you know, the, the just whatever you think that is, yeah, that. So I go and yeah, meet I believe he directed uh, what's that song back then? Didn't want me, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. everybody's stuff, yeah, the, the big Houston movement. He's the one that did the visuals for it, so yeah. I, I definitely remember him. So he we got to talking, come to find out that he's a cinema file like me. And we can talk about movies and not just Boys in the Hood, but John House and Ingmar Bergman. And like, we can talk cinema, cinema, you know what I mean? Which a lot of you wouldn't even, oh, really? Like, yeah, he's, he's heavy on that. And um, he said, hey, man, can you write some videos for me? I'll pay you. I'm like, okay. And so I started writing videos for him while I'm staying in my dad's house working on a novel. Uh, and I was writing up. I was working on a novel and I was hanging out at my cousin's house, um, this painter uh, who was really popular, real, you know, he's still hot. He's real hot then, uh, named Angebert Matoir. And so I was hanging out at Angebert's studio and writing music videos, working on this novel, saving up some money, you know. And then I get a call from L.A. This guy says, hey, man, you know, and the writer's strike, you know, it just went was about to actually it just jumped off. So he calls me and says, yo, this guy named David Roman says, yo, I'm going to shoot some sizzle reels for MTV and, and uh, BBC, which is interesting. So a sizzle reel for the audience is like a little promo trailer or proof of concept uh, for a TV show. And I had never done anything before. He said, come, to, come back to LA. I got a budget. I can pay you. And you know, I'll teach you how to do this. So I go back and we do a couple of small ones. I'm making a little money. And then we end up producing Snoop Dogg's Fatherhood. And the money from that let me plant my feet back in LA and start to get back to moving. I started booking to write screenplays. And that's what happened, man. And then, yeah, that's exactly what happened. It's funny how, uh, you know, life will send you down various uh, corridors and things like that that you didn't expect. Yeah. You, know, you had to go all the way to Houston just to really get back on your feet in LA. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know, so. The thing is, you know, the thing is, what we say out here is, man, you can't go home. You can't go home. That, like, everybody knows that. Like, out here is rough. Like, if you're trying to do something, you know, and, and it takes a minute or you, you know, you, but the, you can't go home, bro. The only time you can, so I, I broke the rule, but I had no choice. But I was doing research for my book. So it's like, okay, the woman kicked us out, me and the old man, and, and we left, man. He went to Florida, I went to Houston. 
you know? And you can only come back. You got to come back like Alexander, man, on a, on a <laughs> goddamn chariot, man. So I know plenty of people from Houston went, did their little time in L.A., had the experience, and then they get chewed up and spit out, you know, and they back home. Like, uh, you know, I wasn't trying to let that be me, dude. By the time I went back to Houston, I had already been a successful lawyer for years. And people in Houston knew that. Okay. I was a writer. So what's crazy was back home, everybody would associate you with, you know, the Hollywood lawyer thing. You know, particularly for black folks, man, for us, like saying you're a lawyer or a doctor is really a status symbol. You know what I mean? And Very much so. We lean into that. Like, it's funny when I go home now, and, and I've been a writer way longer than I was uh uh, a lawyer, they'll still go back to the law thing. I'm like, dude, the rest of my life is sexier than that. What are you talking about? That's what you want to talk about? Okay. But I think that, you know, I went home, some people looked out for me. I did some work. I got back on my feet and yeah, shit started popping. Like for real. Uh, so I want to touch, touch on, you know, your novel. Uh, you know, before we get get into you know the the film piece, um, and this was like around what two two thousand fourteen. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. You're uh, it's called Red Now or Later's. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I found a review of the book that I really like. I'm gonna read it real quick. Um, set in Houston's South Park neighborhood, Guillory's first novel is a no holds barred yet ultimately haunting in every sense of the word account of growing up poor, black, Creole, Catholic, smart, and smart alecky in an urban ghetto beset by poverty, but rich in food, music, language, religion, and connections to the dark side of the spirit world. That to me really, you know, like you said, sets you up as, you know, this writer that writes, quote unquote, uh, weird. Uh, you know, tell me a little bit about how that you know, where the idea for that novel came from. Uh, is it kind of a origin story for you? Um, you know, I know you're Creole. Uh, is that part of, you know, your growing up and, and what you saw? Well, I can say this now since I'm not on book tour. And some critics and, and reviewers caught this quick. You know, it's a, it's a veiled biography. And there's a long history of literary fiction authors whose first work is a veiled biography, you know. Um, it initially started off as a collection of short stories about kids that I grew up with in South Park. And, you know, I've been isolated for a long time. And I think even the minute I left law, it just became seclusion, you know what I mean? And you know, kind of you're out on your own, man. Like when you live it out, particularly when like you live, like when you homeless, man, like shit, you understand the world in a different way, you know, and the basics become something that you pay more attention to, like food <laughs> and lights and things like that. I had this collection of stories. Bear in the was, yeah. Those short stories that were getting published when I lived at that house, that was the framework for Red Knowledge. So I was doing a memoir of this really famous former gangbanger and a non-active gangbanger, I should say, and filmmaker, a guy named Bone Sloan. He directed a documentary called Bastards of the Party on HBO. And okay. uh, Wood Harris, the actor, and uh, Antoine Fuqua, the director, said, yo, you got to holler at Gallery you know, to uh, do your memoir, you know, and uh, we met, we we clicked really easy. And, uh, uh, you know, he had an agent in New York, book agent, who was trying to set it. She threw all these big authors at him, you know what I'm saying? Big, like call some whitehead, stuff like that. To come, okay. he kept saying, nah, you gotta let Guillory do it. He get it, he, you know, he understands, he understands LA street stuff, you know? And she's like, well, who's who's Gallery? And so he kissed me back, like, look here, homie. Uh, they don't know who you are, man. Can you send them some words or something, like some samples or something? So I sent her uh, a short story 
and a chapter of a book that I was working on, another book that I was working on. And he calls me like the next day, like, look here, homie, she want to holler at you. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So I get on the phone and come to find out she's a big deal. Uh, her name is Charlotte Shahidi. Ali Shahidi's mom, the, the actress from Breakfast Club and all of that. Okay. And she was like, yo, she wanted to definitely talk to me about his memoir, but she was really interested in what I was doing. She loved my voice. And um, I said, I got these stories about these kids I grew up with, and I want to turn it into you know, a collection of short stories. She's like, look here, honey, they're not buying short story collections now. You should turn it into a novel. And she compared it to Perdido Street to the extent that there's a lot of little anecdotes that are connected. And okay. so I said, okay, I hear you. And so I thought about it for six months. I didn't just answer just cause, you know, I'm not, I didn't look at myself as a novelist. I write screenplays and I was doing some short stories. And, you know, what I didn't tell myself was, I don't know how to write a book. Uh, I don't know, I couldn't tell you how to write a book right now. I can do it. I can tell you how to write a screenplay, but I didn't know, right? Mm -hmm. After six months, I decided I would take those short stories and I would do it. And so I agreed to do it, right? Um, she wanted to go out and shop it. She didn't really know how to shop it. You know, she did a best effort. And then I called this cat named Quincy True, who is a, a, a poet, novelist. He wrote the book Pursuit of Happiness. He wrote all these Miles Davis books and stuff, older cat. And um, we had, this guy in Atlanta had connected us and he was familiar with my writing. And so I called him on the phone and uh, he's in New York. And I say, look here, man, you're always saying black male literary fiction authors is dying. I, you know, I'm trying to get a book deal. Can you help me out? Either yes or no. I put him on the spot. <laughs> and he was interested. Quincy's interesting because, like, Quincy's the guy that, like, every time you call him, he lives in New York, he's always driving his car. He's the only person I know in New York. When you call him, they're in their car driving always and say, oh, yeah, let me pull a call, you know. <laughs> He gave me two numbers, the woman at Simon & Schuster, the woman at Harper at, uh, at uh, Harper Collins. Hit up the woman at Simon & Schuster first. Three weeks later, I had an offer for a three-book deal at Simon, right. at Simon & Schuster. I took those short stories, used it as a framework, right, and built around it. The short stories total were about 60 pages. When the dust settled, it was about an 800 page manuscript and only one of the short stories survived. And the book was called Red Knowledge. At the same time, I was producing my first house record for um, Ocean Lottie's Yoruba Records, where we created this thing called Lit House, Literature and House Music. And so I had Garth Trinidad, this radio personality out here, read my work over tracks I was making. And that was happening simultaneously at my flat, so it was constant work. You go work on a baseline for a couple hours, then you go do like five hours on some pages, you know, take a break, then go back, maybe work on your hi-hat, get it crispy, then come back and look, review what you just wrote and write some more. So like, yeah, man, it was about a good, about a good year, year and a half of that. And, uh, and I was testing it, we threw this night on Thursday nights in Korea time, a spot called the R Bar, called Jim Kelly. And that's where we were testing the music on the dance floor. I never yeah. needed to be a DJ. I just wanted to hear what my music was going to sound like. So the book comes out to critical acclaim, you know. Um, and I got a Star Kirkus review off the galleys. I didn't even know what that was. And so the head, she's passed now, like the head of Atria, called me up with like on speakerphone folks to let me know, yo, your debut novel just got a star Kirkus review and everybody started clapping. My my broke ass, I'm like, hey, you know, send me some more money. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> everything just moved from there, man. Like, yes, yeah, it's, it's crazy how shit works. Only thing I can say is, yo, you gotta be willing to bet on yourself, dude. If you can, I do it all the time. And none of this shit makes sense or is rational, usually. 
you know, everything is speculative. And even when you try new stuff, you know, and man, I, I just feel like, man, if you can't bet on yourself, man, like, who can you bet on, man? But see that, I mean, you know, for me, that's another underlying definition of being a rebel because a lot of us, you know, uh, are scared of success. Uh, we're scared to get out there and test the waters. And, you know, if you have a, if you're an accountant, but you really want to try to be an artist, you know what I mean? Scared uh, of rejection. That's what people are scared of. Oh, you want all the success. Rejection. Now, yeah. I'll say this for the record and the money. In the game I'm in now, that I've been in now for 17, 18 years out here doing what I do, you know, pitching stuff, you know, going up. For, look, and actors know this too. We deal with more rejection in one year than the average person is going to deal with in their entire life. Facts. So you get accustomed to it. You get accustomed to notes. You get accustomed to people not getting it, you know, and you can't be in your feelings about it. You know, you got to keep it moving. If you if one little off note or off review throws you and you get all sore about it, you're not going to make it, man. You're not going to make it because in the process, you have to you have to. Uh, you have to be, you have to be, you have to not just believe in yourself, you have to know. And sometimes that may appear delusional to people around you who care about you. And that's the weird part. You know, the thing you'll hear, like, I had a girlfriend once when I was going through that transition. She said, why don't you get a real job? Why don't you get a regular job? I know I believe uh, in you. Popular refrain. I believe in you, baby, but, you know, or I believe in what you're doing, but maybe you should. The but, nah, dude, you can't get, I mean, man, I'm living testament to, can't get it like that, dude. You just can't. You got to surrender. You know, because once you surrender, then it's cool. You know, I'll tell you this much. When I was living in that park, I can't believe I'm talking about this in public. Well, why not? It's about time. I'd say at one point I'm going to start talking about that. Man, I felt so free. I felt free. I was not like, ooh. I went through a little bit of that. I went through the disappointment the first couple of months. I was disappointed in myself. That shit, man, nothing worse than the feeling of self-betrayal. That's the worst feeling, dude. I was like, man, did I, did I make the right choice? You know, is this the right thing to do? Should I have kept being a lawyer, you know, stay on that trajectory? But my heart was saying, no, nah, we supposed to be doing this. And there's nothing to tell you how long you got to ride in the dirt. You know, how long you got to grind it out. You know, there's nothing to tell you that. And what happens and I've seen it happen with other artists, because in the arts, you know, artists, we live like that a lot of times, is you get withdrawn because you don't want to explain yourself to people, man. Why, you know, well, what happened to this? Why are you not being a lawyer anymore? What the hell you care for, man? You don't pay none of my bills, you know? And, and so what happens is to avoid that, you become withdrawn, man. And so I withdrew. A lot of people who knew me out here as a lawyer, they didn't see me anymore. I wouldn't emerge till years later as this writer, novelist, DJ dude. Like, oh, that's what he's, what he's been doing. And the thing about it is I didn't want to ask anybody for anything. I didn't beg. The other thing about the homeless thing was there was, a, there was the prayer and then there were the rules. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The rules. I wasn't going to do anything illegal. I wasn't going to steal nothing, you know, nothing. And I wasn't going to beg because because my, my daddy didn't raise no beggar. And that was it. And I had that prayer. When I kept everything that simple, I could focus on the work I was doing, writing at a park bench, you know, or in the truck, or I go take a walk. I'd sit at a bus stop and write at, on a little bench. So when people read all of like my L.A. stuff and I was sitting around and watching all of this stuff, man, like, you know, it's amazing when you look around out in the world and you pay attention and in your ears sharpen to dialogue. You hear people saying things, you know, you can catch a piece of a conversation, maybe look a little bit, see what's going on. It sharpened my ability, I think, 
to tell the human experience as a writer, because that's what I do. You know, I, I create people for a living, you know, and I think that it was so transformative for me that when I would eventually when things got dope and cool and I go back home, man, it was like my friends, they would ask me about dumb shit, man. Like I've had this amazing ass experience. Y'all may not understand it, but I would love to share it with you. And so when I go home, I only see like five people. They know the stories, you know, that's all I need to see, you know, at this point. Um, and I, and I, I'll, and just, I'll jump. If I could do anything different, I would, I'm not going to, I wouldn't do, I would change a bunch of shit. I would have saved some money. I would have had a side business. If I could avoid not being homeless, I would have avoided that. You know, I'm not going to, I don't think that you got to go live on your feet to get to your, get, get, you know, to get to your art. I don't, that's, you know, there's a, I have a song called The Critic. It's real popular. And as a line says, um, The idea of the artist slaving away in his garret is a deliciously foolish one. We must treasure the life of Vincent Van Gogh. You know, I mean, how many paintings did he sell? One, he couldn't even give them away. That idea of, of going through this poverty and, and, and all of this shit to be an artist is a damn romantic bullshit that people tell themselves to justify their, their, their station in life and their condition. I don't think you need to go through that. So, oh, well, you got to experience pain and stuff. No, nah, you don't. <laughs> no. Nah. I write so much stuff that I haven't felt or experienced and I'll write it well because I know how to write. You know what I mean? And I know how to do research. And I read a lot. That's the other thing I was constantly reading. I never, I have never taken a creative writing course in my life. That's what trips everybody out. I learned how to write from reading. I read a lot. I'm a reader. So. So self-taught. Yeah. Yeah. So you said that, you know, you would go back and change some things. Yeah, I, have to I wouldn't have went through all that. Wouldn't live in no goddamn park, man. Fuck that. Nah. I wouldn't have done that. I would have had some bread. It would have been cool. I would have had a, a cool place to rest my head and work. You know, I'm not going to sit up here and tell you, but for going through all of this and that, you know, nah, man, that's lame. I'm not going to lean into that. Nah, nah. If I could have made it easier, I would have. But you know what? Sometimes that's not the case, you know, and sometimes you, you know, you got to, the most important thing is to deal with and adapt to what's in front of you. If you know, but here's the thing. If you know where you're walking, you know the direction you're headed, it makes every other choice easier. I'm trying to write. I'm trying to get paid to write. I need people who pay for writing to read what I like, what I got, right? Okay, I know what I got to do. Keep writing. Oh, I can't get too many people yet. Oh, don't boohoo about that. Keep writing. Keep writing. Writing kept writing and still do. You know what I'm saying? It's crazy now because I got too much stuff to write and I get paid for it. And so it's like, it's a time thing. And it's funny because it's like, it'll never stop. It's like, yo, write this. We'll give you X amount of dollars or whatever. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Let's go do that. You know, I remember when it wasn't that, you know? Yeah, a really good problem to have now looking back on it. Yeah, I got, I got first world problems now, man. <laughs> I'm good now. So you know, you you put the book out. It's critically acclaimed. Yeah. Uh, fast forward to, you know, making this movie called Gully, where you had been, like you said, you'd been come come to be known as that guy. Yeah. With the Gully script. Yeah. You know, how did you finally get it to where you know you were making it and get it directed and uh, ultimately in the Tribeca Film Festival? Well, what well, was crazy was like nobody wanted to touch the script because it's violent and disturbing as hell. And it deals with a lot of taboos in the black community, you know, and it's raw. It's, it's, uh, the, the thing about it was though, it got me a lot of work because it was well-written and it was a different kind of voice. It's like, yo, this guy can write. And so I started getting calls to do rewrites, original stuff. So I started, you know, slowly started to make money, start to build myself up. I was trying to get this thing done. I had different producers involved in and out. 
uh, you know, Black Hollywood turned its back on it. You know, if Black Hollywood is a thing, I'm not a big fan of that term because it assumes we have some sense of agency and franchise that we don't. You know, we don't operate as a collective. We're all independent contractors. There is no agenda. Regardless of what you see on TV, it don't work like that in Hollywood. So Black Hollywood didn't want to do it. I remember uh, John Singleton's, uh, his, uh, his DP, this guy, Dwight, he said, are you prepared to accept the responsibilities of blood? I mean, shut up, man. <laughs> Marilyn Manson read it. Scott Aronson, who was working with Brian Turner at Melee Films, he was just, he was blown away. Marilyn Manson was looking for something to direct. They sent him this. He was blown away and said, I can't touch this. This is too wild. Marilyn Manson said that. Wow. I was pissed off, wild my ass. I was hoping I could sell it to Marilyn Manson. You know, yeah. I'm, trying my, I'm trying to step it up a little bit. I couldn't get it made, man. And so years go by, I end up having a film made then another film made, still got this thing called Gully, right? And um, Michael Rappaport had just put out the Tribe Called Quest documentary. And I'm trying to remember how I connected with it. Oh, I was at an agency, and this agency was Adrian Brody was looking for something to direct, right? The agent sent it to him, but he was in Brazil getting caught up in this kersnapple of a film they were supposed to be doing. It didn't work out. The agent says, hey, Mike Rappaport, can I let him see it? I'm like, uh, okay, he's doing a tribe thing right now. It's hot. Okay, he's hot right now. Mike loved it. We met. He optioned it. Brought on his cat named named, named Corey Smith, uh, a music manager and and just manager. He, like he's uh, Dave Chappelle's manager, Vince Staples, a whole bunch of people. Solid dude from New York. One hundred. It stayed okay. with Mike for a while, and then we can't really get it set up. Corey brings in these British producers. They said, hey, have you checked out? There's this video director we're really hot on. I'm like, okay, who? This cat named Nabil, Nabil Elderkin. I'm like, oh, okay, let me check him out. So I checked him out. He had a sharp eye. He read the script. He loved it. And um, the script ended up getting in Sundance Screenwriters Lab. So I had to go to that. And I had just started doing a lot of work in TV. And for screenwriting, there's like really three accolades that are, if you can get it, you rock it. Uh, before you go pro, the Nichols Fellowship, if you win that, um, being invited to the Sundance Screenwriters Lab, it's only 10 writers a year. So now, you know, that's a big deal, apparently. You know, Tarantino, everybody, all, you know, all, all the writers have been in that, the dope ones, right? So I was like, oh, shit, I'm going to be in that. Or get an Oscar. But that's it. There's other stuff, but those are the three. So I go to the lab. It was cool. Got to meet a lot of big Oscar-winning writers. They all loved the script. And at the time, these producers were trying to get it going. They pulled some money together. They got it shot. They premiered it at Tribeca last year. And I don't know if I can say it officially yet, but it has been picked up for distribution. I can't say about it. But it should be out in November. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Are you feeling, um, you know, the change or the pivot in the industry with, you know, this COVID? Do you feel like it's still going to see theatrical release or you think it's going to pivot towards? I mean, the- if young people would stay to ass in the house, we would be chill now. I mean, it's really our own fault. You know what I mean? Like, that's the problem. You know, cats are out doing whatever. You know, there's talk like, I just wrote something for BET. They're going to shoot in October in Georgia. I know New Orleans is open for production in a certain kind of way. There's a bunch of new safeguards and things that are in place. Vancouver is starting to shoot. Uh, what's happening is they're creating bubbles. You know, um, I, I just talking that like, who is that? Like, like the one that the NBA is doing? Yeah. Oh, like- Kenny Barris was trying to do that recently with a ride at Trump. I was just talking to his people this morning. And, like, just put everybody in a spot. Just rock out and bang the pages up. You know, like, 
you know. So, but in terms of production, yeah, we'll see. I mean, yeah, it looked like it's gonna happen. Right. We got a captive audience. Nobody can go anywhere. The only thing to do is watch TV. Netflix and Netflix and Netflix. Exactly. Uh, so, you know, you mentioned that you uh, got into TV writing. And, uh, you know, one of the biggest shows that, you know, a lot of people know about, uh, at least, is uh, Empire. Can you talk about, you know, how you write, started writing for that show and kind of where you plan to take it? Yeah. You know, Empire was a trip because, like, I was writing for Marvel on this show called Cloak and Dagger. And so going into my second season on that show, uh, the people in Empire hit my agent up and they were like, yo, you think he'll come right on it, you know? And, you know, one of the things when you're a screenwriter is you want it, you don't want to be a one and out on everything. You want to do at least two seasons on a show so people know, you know, that you're not a moron or crazy. Um, so I said, no, nah, I need to finish the second season at, at Marvel. Then we go to the following year, we're shooting Gully in L.A., and the agents hit me again like, yo, Empire came back again. Like, yo, you want to do this? And they said it's their last season. And so my mother loves the show, right? I don't really watch TV, strangely enough. <laughs> I don't. Uh, I write TV. I don't watch a lot of TV. If somebody says it's a good show, I'll check it out. Or if I'm up for a show, like for staffing, and I haven't seen it, I'll binge and watch the show so I know what it's about when I talk to producers. But I thought about it and I said, dude, how many times are you gonna get to write on your mom's favorite show? So I said, you know what, it's network, it's more money, but it's a long ride. That's a 20, 22 order episode. As a writer, that means you're pretty much working for 11 months, right? I said, okay, I'll do it. And so yeah, I went and did it. Uh, I had worked with Terrence Howard before. He was in my film, Gully, so I knew Terrence. And uh, that season, we had Wood Harris uh, uh, from The Wire fame, and Wood's actually a really, really close friend of mine. So I okay. said, I'll go and do that, and I get to hang out with my boy. He's from Chicago. We shoot the film. We shoot that show in Chicago. It's a big machine. It's a big show for Fox. It's a lot of moving parts. And yeah, I went out there and, and produced my episodes and came back. And we were probably a, ye a week and a half from finishing shooting the series and we got shut down. Wow. So we had to put together a finale with what we had. So, I mean, uh, were you in the in the midst of this you know this final season when the whole jesse Sm smollett uh it's like, happen. time that happened like that was really season five i know he he wasn't there when i got there you know you had writers in the room that was most of them were there the year before and whatever so i missed all of that you know i didn't i didn't know i remember like when we were getting get started the rumor mill was like it's coming back blah 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 and, you know I didn't even know. I don't know. I mean, we were like, we had left room in the story to bring him back if we needed to, or if that was possible. You know, we didn't kill him off. He was still out in the world story-wise. So, you know, I think there was some hope from a lot of people, certainly some of the fans, that we would bring him back. But, you know, we didn't control any of that, you know. And I remember a couple of people asked me, y'all bring them back? It's like, dude, I have no idea. I'm in there writing in the writer's room every day, you know. And I don't know, you know. What did your mom think of it since that's her favorite show? Oh, she was on top of the world. I'm writing on Empire, you know. Yeah, she get to see her, her son's name on screen and all of that, you know. Get pop her collar with her little friends and stuff, you know. It's cool when you can do something that, that you benefit from. And it positively affects the people that you love. You know what I'm saying? Like when you do good things, it makes people you care about feel good. Man, that's great. That's gratifying, man. That's real gratifying. Uh, my father didn't live long enough to see any of this part of the career where the stuff is out. He missed it. He passed uh, six weeks before my first book, before Red Knowledge came out. Wow. Yeah, he missed everything. He missed it, you know. So it happens. Yeah, it's got to be tough. Uh, yeah. do, you, do you feel like she, you know, so she saw both sides. She saw you as a successful lawyer, and then she saw you as a successful writer. Which one do you feel like, you know, she was more proud of, if that's possible? I don't know. Yeah, that was her. You know, she would tell you both because that's my child, you know, that kind of thing. 
I think that there was something lost, whether she admits it or not, from the status of the lawyer thing, you know. But at the same time, then I turned around and you can Google me and I'm like Mr. Hollywood, you know. <laughs> so it's kind of I think it kind of balanced out at the end of the day. Again, when I was pushing, knowing what I gave up gave me extra drive. It's like I gotta be successful at this shit. I can't fail at this because I gave up something dope to do this. Like that's beyond ego. That's just like, nah, dude, you got to win at this. Like you got to work hard. Like but at the same time, there's people that do this and work really hard. They just don't get on. Some of them are talented. Some of them aren't. And you know, that's just the facts. It's like a dice roll a little bit. And I'm not a gambler except for my own life. It's funny. I don't go to Vegas. But I gamble with my life, like, yo, let's go try and do this, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's weird, man. But I believe you should be able to bet on yourself, man. Like, I believe in the individual, man. Like, I believe in working hard and having making sensible moves, making the right connections. And if you got the talent or you got the goods, there's going to be a market for what you got. You know, I know some people working hard on some stuff that I ain't really no market for that. You know, whether they realize it or not is up to them. You know, but yeah, man. <laughs> so you mentioned earlier that uh, you know there's no such thing or a real thing as uh, you know Black Hollywood. Yeah. Do you feel like um, it's a misnomer to 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 say that uh, you know uh, we're not being able to get a chance to tell our stories or you know way too many white writers are white are writing black stories? That's that man. Is that a reality? We, we tell them our stories. I mean, you know, it's what, what happens is right now in particular, this is going to be a little controversial what I'm about to say. There's so much performative going on right now. So much performative with little substance at the highest echelons. Some of the people that the people have crowned and ascended, man, ain't a lot of substance behind that. If you're a thinker, and if you pay attention, there's a lot of buzzwords and sound bites and wokeness and all of this stuff and man a lot of just that shit man right now you know like we're playing on this idea of parlay and white guilt that's a lot of what's going on right and there are folks who are taking advantage of that i guess i don't you know i don't say you know, I would say, why not? You know, of course, go ahead, go do what you can do. And, and you know, but like Black Hollywood assumes like we got meetings and membership cards and shit. That's not the case. This is not. There are a lot more people, there are a lot more of us working and have deals than I've ever seen. I've been working out here since 98 as a lawyer. I've seen this from different angles. It's, yeah, it was different when I got out here, you know, and, and, and it's different in a good way. You know, I think that um, there's a lot of redundancy, you know, and it's things that you can't say because everybody's in their feelings. So what ends up happening is people, you know, it's like episode five of Black as Fuck, you know, people get, you know, they don't want to be honest about stuff, you know. And just I saw that episode. He, he uh he he wanted to say the 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 black filmmakers film was trash, um, but he felt pressure not to do so in open forum. And when he he he, he kind of gathered the other writers and they kind of agreed to say so, but he was like left out on the limb. Because they because nobody wants to be that guy, you know what I mean? Like I have opinions about a lot of people that that folks think are whatever because the media or the way their publicist angled it makes you think a certain way about them but i actually know a lot of these people and some of them are trash dude like for real and don't ask who i tell you <laughs> but some of these people out there holding up as angels or champions of the people or whatever they're complete garbage people they have their character sucks dude writers know it like the cool thing is we don't say anything Everybody in town knows that. You want to know who's garbage? As a writer. They know. They know who's a hack. They know who can't act. They know who is a garbage person. But we just don't say anything, dude. Like, you can't. And you really shouldn't. You know, 
but I just watch it. Sometimes you'll see who's popular and, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, that movie's garbage, dude. Movie got problems. Or this person really hasn't, isn't as woke or great as you think they are. That's just performative, you see. You know, and so there's that, right? And, you know, to me, you know, I don't engage it as much. Like, even what I'm doing now, this interview is different for me. I don't really do this stuff. I rarely step outside of fiction. I've been asked to write op-eds and stuff for, like, you know, The New Yorker and all these Atlantic Month, all these great publications and stuff hit me. I'm not, I'm good. I have no interest in being a public intellectual whatsoever. You know, do I have the capacity? Certainly. I'm well-educated. I'm informed. Uh, I read. I stay up on things. I have opinions, you know. Uh, these are my opinions. They're fine. I don't, you know. And the other thing is, I don't think, like, I remember um, somebody asked me to do a, a blog thing. It was a Fox, remember Fox Atomic out of the UK? It was a little thing that Fox had carved out in the UK. And this was when Obama was running for the first time. Okay. I had dinner with those. I don't know how or who connected it, but I had dinner with the, those folks and they wanted me to you know, contribute. And I was like, nah, I'm good. You know, I, was like, I don't really think I have anything new to say that's not already being said, you know? And I'm not that anxious for you to read me like that or Oh, well, what does he think? Who cares what I think, man? You know, I don't, I'm more interested in the work that I'm doing and that the work comes first, that I'm more interested in what do you think about this new record or this new story, or this new script? You know, I don't, who cares what I think, man? I let the work be in front of me, you know, and I just stay behind it, you know, and I'm cool with that, you know. Um, more recently, I did, so I'm doing this, and I did one with black filmmakers recently aspirants and people getting started and a few people established because and i was talking craft uh and the business because people don't explain and how to like how you need to handle your career as a writer out here because i could i could talk about that at length uh because you can't learn that in no mfa program you know what i'm saying and you may not get that information hollywood doesn't come with a user manual you know there's a lot of rules out here. I've seen, you know, like you said earlier, man, I've seen this town chew people up and spit them out. You know, I've seen it, you know. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm cool. There's, there's so much dumb shit going on right now, not just with, you know, the whole political thing, but how people are responding to things. There's a lack of scholarship that's apropos now, even in journalism, that's ridiculously unacceptable. Uh, there are people using terms and words that they don't fully understand the definition of and that then the definition changes into something else that it's really not. You know what I mean? Uh, you got things like woke. You know, uh, John McWater said something interesting about woke. He's like, one, it's not even relevant anymore. It, and in a year, it's going to be completely different. You know, he's a linguist specialist, you know, uh, and yeah, man, there's so much performative going on. I just fall back and watch it, you know, and look for opportunities to write. And you mentioned uh, everything's performative right now, especially with, you know, the climate where, you know, Black Lives Matter. Do you feel yeah. like there's going to be a shift uh, in Hollywood because of that, because of that performative uh, white guilt uh, that, you know, a lot of people will get opportunities? It's happening now. I'm, I'm, it's happening now. It's going on. There's people... There's people getting deals that shouldn't get deals. NAACP got a first look at something. What the hell has NAACP written? As a writer, I'm offended by that shit. I'm offended when an athlete gets a deal at Netflix. God bless Maverick and LeBron. They cool people. But what the hell, dude? I mean, like, as a person who's committed himself to write, create stories for, how does that, what? How does that work, you know? Uh, although some of them are doing great programming. LeBron's doing fantastic programming, you know. Um, the, the musicians get in the game, you know. Um, I've worked with a lot of them. The moguls from, you know, everybody, 50, Irv, everybody, man, you know. As a writer, it just, it, it annoys me because it's like these folks who are not in the business of telling story 
have an opportunity to participate with agency and leverage with no skill set or track record in telling story in this media just because we popular. And let me tell you just how effed up that is. That's how they look at our community. Bells and whistles, shiny things, right? John Mayer doesn't have an overall at Netflix. Bob Dylan doesn't have an overall at Disney Plus. You feel me? So we're we're the shiny objects right now. No, no, no. Um, Understand what I'm saying. When it comes to our telling of story, the industry doesn't really respect or fully recognize that we do have a community of storytellers. Not how many likes this person got. Or this person's popular. Let's give them a deal. Because black folks will go see it because such and such got it, right? Yeah. We're like, like, we're like the real stories are getting lost. You got our our music talent is getting catered to because they're popular, not because they tell good story. Intellectually, that's fraudulent. Now, let me be very clear. I'm not hating on any of them, you know, and their deals, and they got some wonderful people working for them. They've, you know, they've hired friends of mine. Some of them pick good stuff, you know, some of them don't. I've worked with quite a few athletes who have situations or whatever, whatever, but it always trips me out. Brett Favre doesn't have an overall deal at HBO. Think about that. For some reason, we have to look at or they have to look at what's popular and and crown it. Say, well, you get the because you sold this many records or you cut this, you caught this many touchdowns, you know, you get to have a movie deal, right? They don't do that with the other folks, man. You can be a good solid writer who's worked and whose work is proven, and you can go in there and get a deal. That shit's hard for us, man. We have to jump way more hurdles to get that. So right now, you got companies that are pretty much giving the people you'd expect a deal or whatever, you know, an overall. What does an overall mean? It means that you can hire other writers to develop stuff and tell their story, your story, our story. You are in a position to do that, to, to, to get projects greenlit. It's important. And what do they do? This is how much they think about us. They give it to people who aren't even in this industry, bro. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like there's a part of that that's offensive as shit if you're a writer. Oh, it's great that such and such singer, such and such rapper, such and such athlete gets a deal, you know. NAACP, we're going to give them a deal. Really? What more they got to do with it? I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous, man. It's like, oh, HBO is going to cut a deal with the Urban League. The Urban League. And they're doing great work. Mark and them doing fantastic work. The NAACP, their, 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 their responsibility is to preserve the rights of black folks, the colored people. Not give out no goddamn award because you sold some records, you know. And now it's 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 reduced to that. The NAACP supported and funded most of the major legislation for the civil rights movement. Really jumping off in the forties, coming into the fifties, right? Charles White, Thurgood Marshall, you know what I'm saying? And now it's a, an award show. That's it's how it fits in, you know what I mean? Oh, let's go give them a deal. As a person who creates content, that's offensive to me, man. I just think it's just intellectually fraudulent. I'm happy. Well, you know, I think in the climate that we live in, it, it's it's a, it's kind of a intelligent money grab because you know a lot of us, you know, out here, there's not a lot of substance to anything that we uh, you know uh, give our time to, you know, 
your Instagrams and your TikToks and everything else. It's all very surface. Yeah, you know? it's all surface. And I think and at the same time, though, I will say this is that if an athlete can get a deal, that's fine. Like I say, I ain't mad at none of them. Just make sure you go hire your people who do the work. There are some uh, of these of our people who have deals, who have people running their ship, who are dope know what they're doing not the home there's some of us got the homeboy doing it right it, it's would you say uh 50 cent is is is, is following that that blueprint 50 cent doing it right 50 cent has a well-oiled machine the guy that runs this thing is fantastic a guy named anil Kirian. he knows what he's doing um yeah 50 knows what he's doing there's no doubt about that he pits or he gets in bed with the right people, you know. He gets in bed yeah. with. The he seems like the kind of person that he knows what he don't know, so yeah. he puts he'll the right tell, people in, in place. He'll tell you this. He'll say, uh, you know, if I'm the smartest person in the room, then I'm in the wrong room. You know, that's how he thinks. I know what I know. I, I need to be around people that know stuff I don't know. You know, and so there's a few people. It's not just it's not just fifty. It's it's a lot of places. LeBron's shop is pretty solid. That's a solid shop. They're doing some stuff. Uh, Obama's shop is solid. You know, they got some good people over there at above ground, you know. Oh, no, higher, uh, what's it called? Higher ground. That's the name of his shop. Um, you know, so, yeah, there's some people, I'm not going to name them, they're not really getting it right, you know. They're not. They got the wrong people involved, and it's just a vanity thing, you know what I mean? They got a deal, they got money, but they're just not doing it right. You know, so we'll see. You know, it's a hard road, but we'll see. Yeah, you you know, you always have that where you know people kind of throwing spaghetti against the wall, hope it sticks. Uh, and some of it will, and a lot of it won't. A lot of it won't. Mm -hmm. A lot of it won't. <laughs> uh so you know, before we before we get out of here, I, I kind of want to give you a chance to kind of delve into some of the things that you have on the horizon that you can't speak of. I know a lot of it. It's still, you know, in the deal phase and, and negotiations, things like that. Uh, but can you talk about maybe one or two projects you have that's yeah. in fruition? A lot of it's just press restrictions. <laughs> you know, like I have a cartoon I'm developing at Fox, at FXX. Uh, it's really funny. It's a quarter hour, John. It's really wild. Um, uh, I have a new show that I'm out with now that probably will get picked up, um, set in Hollywood, um, developing a project with Issa Rae and Michael Strahan's company right now uh, for HBO, doing that. Um, what else can I talk about? Oh, man, there's some real sexy stuff coming up, too. <laughs> yeah, I just can't go into it just yet. But... Uh, and working on a new novel, and I got some new music coming out. The new novel um, is completely different from the last one. It's, it, I will say this about it. It's set in the Pacific Northwest. That's where it's set. <laughs> okay, so it's going to be very granola. Ooh, not so much, but it's... <laughs> no way you can find a way. <laughs> I lived in Seattle for a year and a half, right? And... It was one of the strangest experiences I ever had, man. And the people out there are special. And the black people out there are extra special. And for the longest time, I was trying to figure out, what is it, man? What's up with black people out here? And I just, it was bothering me because I couldn't put my finger on it, you know? I have a daughter in, in uh in Surrey, Canada, man, and over there. So I'm up there a lot. And I lived in Seattle for a bit. I got some family up there. And the the Pacific Northwest is so like there's a part of it that's so chill and like even with the Canadians, because the it took me a while to figure the Canadian thing out. Cause I just couldn't, what's up with the Canadians, dude? And I realized in order to understand the Canadians, you have to understand your Americanism. And once you understand that, then you can get them. So the thing with the Canadians is this. They don't trip about a lot of shit, dude. It doesn't make them naive. It doesn't make them infantile. It doesn't make them less than. 
they're actually less stressed out than we are. And they look at us like, you guys are tripping about everything. But the black folks in the Pacific Northwest, I could not put my finger on it. And the more I thought about it, I said, mm, this is the beginning of a novel. And I had a theory I'm playing with. And it's in fiction. And uh, it's going to be fun. Hopefully it'll be out next year. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Well, man, I, you know, I, I could sit here and uh, listen to your stories all day. Um, you know, you've got a very interesting life uh, on both sides of the coin, you know, before and now, uh, before writing and now in, within writing. And, uh, you know, we can't wait to uh, see some of your new work and uh, your new novel and new shows and new, de- new ventures. Uh, so for, you know, the uh, audience here at uh, Rebel Without Applause, we really thank you for joining us and um, hope that you remain safe and uh, healthy out here and, uh, you know, try to avoid this uh, this pandemic and we can all get on the other side of it. Yes, please. Wear a mask. Don't go to group shit. That's retarded. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, that's it for us. Uh, thanks again, Marcus. And um, we'll see you uh, next time. And, uh, you know, for all the rebels out there, stay rebellious. For sure.